Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for Noble Prog's AI webinar with our subject matter expert, Dr. Anne Redipogu. Noble Prog are an advanced technology international training and consultancy organisation, and we are delighted to be able to host this webinar today to hopefully address some of the questions, concerns, and general interest around AI that we are currently hearing. The format of today's webinar will be approximately 45 minutes for part one, followed by an opportunity to ask questions and then around half an hour for part two. If you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to add them to, to the Q&A box along the bottom toolbar on the screen. During the Q&A session, if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and you'll be given the opportunity to speak. I will answer as many questions as she can in the time allocated. We will be recording today's session, which we'll send out to all participants after the event. So please feel free to share this with anyone you think may be interested. It will also be available on our YouTube channel and website. We will include our contact details in the follow up email. So if you'd like to provide feedback, ask questions or request any information on any of our courses, please reach out. We're very lucky to have Dr. Anne Redipogu delivering today's webinar. And I hope you all enjoy the session. I'll hand over to Anne to introduce herself and get started. Hello, everybody. Thank you all for joining me today from around the world. I know all of you come from different backgrounds and different disciplines, and it's a pleasure to host you all today. Um, I live in Scotland, the place of medieval castles and also the birthplace of James Watt and the steam engine that started the Industrial Revolution 255 years ago. Today, we are here to talk about the AI revolution that's causing us a lot of curiosity and anxiety and frankly, more questions than answers. So let's um, start. Um, my name is Anne. It's short for artificial neural networks. So here we go, let's get started. I'll just share my screen in a second. Okay, um, we are here to talk about a new era and new technology um, that is artificial intelligence. There is a lot of buzz around AI. Um, AI has really peaked up curiosity a lot in a lot of sectors. It is not a technology of the future, but it's a technology that is of today that's shaping our future. AI is in the news a lot. The Pope is interested in the ethics of AI. There's a lot of talk about regulation around things like virtual reality. Virtual reality is something that's a topic of research in the field of AI that wants to transform the way we work, the way we interact in our meetings, in our education systems, in every walk of life. So for example, um, virtual reality can help in understanding the inner workings of our human body. This uh, virtual reality itself isn't uh, something that is you know going to happen tomorrow is is something that probably everyone thinks about and but it is happening it is it is it will be a future it is already used in education systems the other one is home delivery of food amazon is trial testing delivery of their goods through drones ai assisted drones and we are also having uh, even posts and you know snail mail can be delivered by uh, AI systems. Your barista could be an artificial intelligent robot uh, that will you know feed you ne the next time you're there. And the of course, Chat GPT is one of the biggest uh, buzzwords around and there are many large language models that are being used today. Now what exactly is chat GPT is using huge amounts of data taken from the internet, scraped from the internet and from various sources that humans have actually developed and giving us instant answers. There is also a talk 
and research into uh, areas such as biometrics. Every time you're at an airport, uh, you are, you know, my finger fingers are scanned finger for, for my fingerprints, five of them. This is a lot of data. A lot of this data has to be stored, has to be analyzed, and then align, uh, tagged with your name to it. Now, this is not always possible, and it requires huge amount of computer sources. So a lot of the data that you are probably thinking you're giving you know, a government authority or an airport authority is probably being deleted or overwritten several times. So each image is a high definition image that requires a, you know, enormous computer capacity. The next thing uh, is also where research is, uh, you know, a, a big topic these days is retinal recognition. Retinal recognition is uh, an invasive procedure. There are several problems with retina that can affect the recognition of you as a person. Um, it also involves quite a lot of, now, when we hear about uh, things like uh, or systems or products like ChatGPT, we would think that AI has solved it all. But retinal recognition is still a very difficult topic and it's not 100% reliable and successful in prediction. Um, Google has got a system, a health system that tries to recognize retinal neuropathy uh, and it has failed by 200%. Cancers are also an area that are being uh, looked into. There's a digital pathology uh, research departments around the world that are trying to recognize and predict cancers early. This is, again, not successful in real life. It's giving us 100% results in the lab laboratory, but when they're actually implemented in real life, it's fails by several percent. Now, when we are doing predictions for financial organizations or financial system, it is okay to get a you know, prediction rate of accuracy of 60% or 70%. But in terms of things like cancers or health related diagnoses, we need 100% accuracy. Now, the next one is self-driving cars. We've heard a lot about them that we don't have to drive our cars anymore. Um, they'll just drive us around. The cars will drive us around themselves. But then who are the consumers of these products, these cars? In Scotland, where I live, it's quite difficult to uh, drive around the roads that we have, the narrow pathways and passing places and the hills and valleys. Um, and so where are they going to be used? And what is the accountability of these products? Who, how do we decide whether we turn right or wrong? Who, who is responsible for uh, the, if an accident happens? Is it the designer? Is it the algorithm maker? Is it you know, the driver. And then what happens to the insurance and other things that we are used to uh, using uh, currently? Uh, who is insured? And then the decision making is more about if you turn right, you kill a little girl. If you turn left, you turn and you'd kill an older woman, which way to turn. So how do we train these systems for better decision making? Um, what about bias in these systems? And then comes the question of affordability. Are these systems really affordable? Um, who will buy them? Uh, and then we know about systems where there are companies trying to profile you into understanding how you shop, how you date, how you browse, what you like on the internet and what you don't like and so on. These systems want to know you fully, obviously for ads, but then there are other technology being developed which are ad blockers. Now, um, 
the next level of digitizing is really digitizing your entire body, scanning your entire body for your health uh, perspective, from your health perspective and your mind to understand your psychology on how you vote and how you make choices in life. Now, we really are entering a digital world, a world that is just data and data and data that are we're not only creating, but we are producing from our human bodies. The societal structure is completely going to be changed in an AI world. We are creating a digital society that's beyond our recognition. And are we ready as a human race to embrace this AI technology? Are we ready to just go, yes, okay, bring it on. And we love these products. Uh, how are these go products going to affect us individually? Uh, they think I ask questions on data privacy, AI bias, the job displacement, how transparent are these systems and how accountable are these systems comes in all the time. Uh, digital products have already, or technology has already changed or had an impact on our social fabric. Uh, and AI is just going to take it to the next level of uh, impacting the way we live our lives, the way we interact with each other, the way we work and the way we live. Are we ready for this technology? And are there questions that we need to ask today? What about an AI coach? Are we ready for an AI coach? Society is very likely to have or use AI coaches for various, um, various aspects in life, various, various tasks in life, from learning about chess to learning about carpentry or learning coding or learning um, any aspect, chemistry to mathematics to about the human body. Um, AI coaches are here to stay. And AI coaches probably will um, do a better job than humans because they don't get tired. They probably have an answer for everything. We can probably train them really well. Here's a little girl trying to learn some AI moves, AI dance moves, um, a, a robotic move nonetheless, but still an interaction that's going on with a machine. Can we actually cope with it? Is this a society that we are trying to attain? AI therapy is also not far from reality. Um, it's not just physical therapy, but also emotional and mental therapy. Someone who may have autism or dyslexia may feel more comfortable with a machine than a human being. Now, this again has to be tested. We are also probably going to have AI companions better than probably a spouse. Uh, they won't have feelings, they will never say the AI would never under, understand us because these AI systems are actually trained to know you, understand you fully. They're interactive and they're conversational. It's just is the next level of Alexa. Um, we already have AI surgeons or robotic surgery uh, at the moment, the human team still is in the vicinity or in the picture, um, you know, working in, in with the surgeons. But soon the reality could be that um, we don't need the surgeons at all in place. We don't need nurses in place. So are we ready to be patients um, who are consulted and operated on by a robot. Uh, is that, when is that going to happen? If that is going to happen, what about the data related to it? Um, what is the next level of surgery for mankind? Here's a guy trying to exercise with an AI system. The AI system can be made adaptive. 
we have we can have AI shopping assistants that uh, will help us shop from welcoming us at the shop. Now these systems already again know you or know a lot about your shopping preferences and trends and you know various aspects related to what color you like or what type of clothes you tend to generally go for, your body shape and weight. Um, so they could just completely, completely understand your shopping preferences who will then go on to assist you in the shops. We can, uh, we can also have, or there, there, we can actually um, picture the scenario of AI police and firefighters. Uh, where human beings be difficult for human beings to go into these uh, situations, we can send in uh, AI robots or firefighters and police to go in. So eventually, we would just have AI uh, an AI workforce taking over different aspects of our life. Um, we from coding to um, printing out legal documents, to doing manual tasks that are quite difficult for humans, um, we will be living alongside robots or AI systems. They may not be you know, exactly in a robotic form, but we be very likely to have systems where we are working alongside uh, machines. And machines truly are going to overtake humans in the sense, not just in doing our tasks for us, but also in terms of the number of machines that exist versus the number of humans on the planet. And who are going to work on all of these things? It, it, is, it is not difficult to imagine a scenario where these jobs are shipped out or outsourced to countries like India, and China, where there's a huge workforce, less regulation, and uh, a willingness to an IT, you know, cheaper workforce as well. So jobs are going to become difficult in many countries, um, are rarer in many countries. And so now the problem then becomes who is going to buy all the products that are being developed money becomes a scarcity and we will be distributing the limited wealth that nations may have among ourselves. Um, there is talk about a universal income that we would all get uh, if, we're not if we don't have a job. And um, the distribution, of course, we have no idea. I'm not sure if policymakers are looking into this or, or what the idea is. So the whole economics as we actually understand it is um, difficult to imagine the way it actually already is. It's no, it, We have to change the whole economic system. We'll have a supply of all of these AI systems where the demand may be high as well, but the uh, availability of resources to afford these systems may be more and more difficult. So we end up in a scenario, a, a sort of a limbo really of, you know, where are we going with all of this? Are we going to have live in a jobless society? Are we going to actually live in a society where we, our skills are not utilized? Um, and then it becomes much more important as personally, how do we achieve our dreams? How do we utilize our task? And what does my future actually mean in an AI society? So let's actually um, see if the AI is really sustainable. AI, uh, one of the UN SDGs is uh, sustainable cities, not smart cities, but sustainable cities and communities. We have developed technology that is um, not an uh, environmentally friendly uh, system as we realized. And is AI going to be sustainable? Now, what exactly 
is AI. I mean, I'm not going to go into all of the details, but it's um, lots of processing units, processing sensory information um, in our brain, from our sensory organs in our brain and giving outputs for us to make decisions. And obviously the processing that's going on, processing that we are capable of is so capable that we are able to build intelligent machines. And that's exactly what we are trying to replicate in computer systems. So there are various groupings or sectors or subsections within artificial intelligence. Some of you might have heard of deep learning, artificial neural networks, and large language models. So in this interconnected world where there's unlimited exchange of data and there's unlimited data available, it became more and more easy for us to think of having a intelligent system that could gather all of this data, process it and produce intelligent results. But this unlimited amount of data is actually causing, is it causing us more problems? Is data really, um, that's going to help, that, that, is, is data one of the things that we have to try and curb? Is data causing more greenhouse gases than we realize? Um, this is one person developing a uh, statistical system and trying to understand data and I have developed during this talk, I have actually had to have 10 different versions of my presentation that you know, has several megabytes or gigabytes. Um, where is all this stored in the cloud? Uh, what is really the cloud? How much data are we generating? My cat videos, my dog videos, my uh, cheesecake videos are all in the cloud. And these systems, and that's just on a personal level, but when you talk about banks, corporations, healthcare systems, the number of, um, the amount of data that's, go that's generated is enormous, too large, too big. Um, and security systems related to that. Are these ones and zeros going to drown us? Are these ones and zeros going to actually uh, kill what we have on planet Earth. So what exactly is the cloud? The cloud is a service and service, rows and rows of tech that stores all our data running 24 seven, consuming a lot of power, energy, electricity. They get very hot and so they need air conditioning systems to cool them down, which requires additional power. So the systems actually, and, and are they actually storing very important data? A lot of the time, not. There's got 10 different versions of my selfies, 100 different versions of an apple or a video of a bird, something I've seen in the nature that I've taken. So a lot of the time, um, we are using a lot of energy that's actually responsible for a lot of greenhouse gases in these systems that is hidden away. There are also legal aspects. These jobs also can be taken up by robots, but there are also legal aspects such as if you have Indian data on a British company, uh, on American servers that are located in Colombia, how do we actually you know, utilize these? How, how do we get past all the legal jurisdictions? So it's it's, Data security, data legality, data pro I, protection becomes a huge nightmare. Each of us has have so many devices already, and we are going to have even far more devices uh, in our ha homes, in our smart homes. So let's just think about how much energy one human being is going to be needing for all the devices. What if uh, there are other issues with AI systems? So if you're so reliant on these AI systems, what if the battery dies? Um, plugging them in, charging them constantly. What if the battery dies during a 
very important surgery or when you're driving your car, your autonomous car, um, what if there is a fatal error when you're right in the middle of actually uh, a video presentation that you know can happen to any of us? What, uh, what if there's uh, algorithmic errors that lead to um, issues that are beyond algorithmic error, but it'll still give you an output that looks real, that looks right. You just take it for granted, you submit it or use it wherever. So there are many, many aspects that you will you we, we will have to look into as we get into this AI world. And of course, we already all already have problems with hackers. And as we digitize our entire world including our human bodies, including our minds, our brains, um, everything to do with even our pets probably, we are susceptible to hackers, um, not just at a government level, but also at an individual level. Uh, important information, and again, the important, What's important, what data is important may also change. Um, what we think is important now may not become important. So in a jobless world where there's no money, nothing, universal income, financial data is probably not going to be important. Now to deal with all of that, we have AI chips that are coming up, GPUs. They, what they want to do is make them faster, um, less, more heat tolerant, um, processing, higher processing speeds. So it's almost like we are inventing a problem and then trying to invent a solution for the problem. So why use so much data in the first place or why use systems, uh, why produce systems or produce products that we don't need and then create issues and then try to find solutions to solve those issues that we have created ourselves. So it just seems to be like we're going on a merry-go-round. Um, but and we also seemed in the in the process somewhere during the industrial revolution and our digital progress, we seem to have lost our way with what is right and wrong for society? What do we really need for society and what do we not need for society? A lot of the time, the solution is right in front of us, but we seem to be complicating systems unnecessarily. Just because I can get 5,000 machines to clean my entire house, I'm not going to use that. It's just, I'm just going to say, no, thank you. I can do it myself with a brush. So perhaps we have to actually think about what we actually need. Are we creating more problems than solutions? And how do we go from here? So that was our first part to just give a glimpse into an AI world. We will now take questions, answer a few questions, and then go into our second part. Um, so the first part, um, was all about trying to see if the AI world we are creating um, really is what is all it's going to be, supposed to be, um, and whether it's worth putting in all our effort and investment and energy into developing these, and what kind of world are we going to envisage. So we obviously have seen that um, Jobs are going to be a problem. Money is going to be a problem. Universal credit is something that may be benefit that may be given to all individuals. Um, and are we able to live with these systems? So I'll just open the floor uh, for questions just right now. Please feel free to ask any questions. There are no right and wrong questions. Some uh, uh so please, let, let's make this more interactive and make the discussion more lively. Thank you so much for your participation and I look forward to your questions. Okay, so we've got the first question we've had. Uh, um, regarding the use of AI to diagnose early cancer, from where were the images obtained? If they're from open sources, what happened to confidential information restrictions 
do the images come from open journal articles? Um, thanks, Carol. Thank you so much for your question. Thank you for your interest in the subject. Um, it really is important that more people get involved in AI with the right attitude to, to do good in society. Um, yes, uh, images are not all available um, openly. Um, there are various medical image banks available, um, open source that you can use, medical data as well, some of it um, is available. You can also create fictitious images to actually um, try and, you know, just do a prototype of this AI system and then use and then use real images. But it would be good to be attached to a hospital system or, or a research lab that could actually, you know, provide uh, images that are tagged in the right way. Um, usually these are also not that accurate because the tagging of these images are done by one oncologist probably or one radiologist. Even in some of the sophisticated research labs that I visited, there was just one oncologist and there's always, you know, it's a prone to human error. Um, and also the problem is with early diagnosis of them. So if you have one which is stage one cancer, for example, it's very difficult even with, uh, with the naked eye, even for the oncologist to actually recognize that it's grade one cancer. And that's where the cancers get missed or can't be diagnosed early. It's not a big deal. It's not rocket science, if you like, if some late stage cancers are recognized by an AI system. So the whole exercise, the whole point is really to have um, early cancers recognized. But yes, the, the point is some images are available. You can make up your own images as well, um, just, to, just for the purpose of building a prototype, just to play about with the system and then attach yourself to a you know, research center to obtain more real images, real data. Great, thank you, Anne. Um, so another question, um, what are your thoughts on AI and humans' use of critical thinking skills? Might constant use impact our mental capacity or not exercising our brain centers as much could impact capacity to think and reason? Yes, absolutely. Um, I I was pr talking uh, in Dublin recently and there were some young people in the group and honestly, they didn't want a, a, a society where they were not using their brains anymore. They were not exercising their thinking skills anymore. Um, the whole point that advocates of AI would actually suggest is that um, humans will still be able to involve in thinking but will get they'll get rid but not in mundane routine repetitive scenarios and so the idea is that they would be all engaged in higher level thinking um in maintaining these machines producing these machines and so on but then you know these machines themselves but that could be a small group of people um, because just the money needed for developing these systems is enormous. It's it's too huge. Um, it's in, you know, data is in petabytes, um, storing the data, procuring the data, um, processing the data itself um, is expensive. Um, and then developing systems that could understand and analyze the data is even more expensive. So I'm sure a lot of us who won't have jobs uh, will, lead, will face a scenario where the skills are just, you know, maybe those who, are, who won't be in corporate jobs will learn other natural skills, uh, digging around the garden or living more, you know, stone age lives. Um, 
I don't want to say Stone Age, but more natural lives um, rather than in this artificial system. But we still have to use artificial products, I suppose. So yes, it's a scenario where exercising the brain becomes more and more limited. Great, thank you. Um, another question. Um, the machines designed to store or maintain data suffer from data deluge. So how do we know that the output is reliable? The output is actually um, not very reliable. Um, I can say that because if it were reliable, if we know that it can do its job really well, we would have cancer predictions now. At the moment, they are not reliable. Um, the efforts are to make them more reliable. Um, so, for example, in banks, they're already using these systems. I, I always try to see which of the sectors has actually been at the forefront of using the technology. And financial organizations have been at the forefront in using these technologies, mainly because it doesn't matter if they made a wrong decision in giving a person, uh, one of their customers, a bank loan or a credit card or declining them of a need, a financial need. Um, but they have no idea of knowing whether they've made the right decision unless they follow that person over a certain length of time. And so, yes, systems are not reliable and there is a lot of bias. Um, and I have met with people who develop these systems who were making un decisions that were introducing bias unknowingly. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's going to be a while before we know. And I think we will understand whether these systems are becoming more reliable as we start using them more. more. Um, as we have autonomous vehicles, driverless cars, and you know, less of more prone to accident, it really is an experiment. It's really a trial and error, just as with AI systems generally. Um, so it's a matter of time before these systems become more reliable, but what I have seen so far, they are not very reliable. Great, that's brilliant. Thank you, Anne. Have you got any other questions that you can see to, to, to answer? Um, So another question that Carol has posed was wondering if high level thinking will bring forth a decrease in communication skills. Just a thought that, yeah. Um, yes, um, I think communications, I think it'll get to a point where because we will be interacting and communicating with machines, and machines will be trained more precisely with understanding. I wouldn't say understanding language in the real sense where how we understand another human being's um, words, but definitely a machine that would understand what, if I say something like, I'm really anxious today, I wonder if you have some nice words to say, or I'm cooking a recipe and I'm really excited and buzzed with, you know, my friends are coming, five of them are coming. Can you suggest a recipe? These are the things I have in my fridge. Um, it'll understand language like that, but higher level thinking and higher level understanding um, may be a thing of the past. We are already losing our communication skills, I think, um, generally as a human species. And this may actually become more difficult, but in other ways, if we are we are jobless and we're sitting around digging our gardens and so on, perhaps we have time to contemplate. Perhaps we have time to become more philosophical. Perhaps we are we have time to meditate and look into ourselves, because 
at a time when these machines are confusing us with so much information, so much data, and if I can put it, so much fake news, then fake people, um, fake voices, and so on, we will have to develop the ability to differentiate or understand what's right or wrong, what's real and not real, and maybe our skills will become sharper. So that it's not just a decline, but we, we may see a scenario where our, our ability to sense our sensory systems become more sharper because of the confusing signals we are getting from um, outside, from our external world. So our, to cope with the external world, our internal systems may become sharper. Um, thanks, Carol, for your questions. Anyone else? Please feel free. I've got one here, and I've got another question from uh, from Jean for you. Is there a fear about computer hacking and crime increasing with with the development of AI systems? Well, they will be hacked, but what are they hacking into? Um, if everyone has our information, if everyone has our data, we have no money. Um, what really are they hacking into? Um, so. Yes, initially we will see a, a systems being hacked, but on the other hand, they will realize that just, just hacking into my cat videos and my dog videos and me browsing through things that just make no sense on TikTok probably. Um, so, and then financially, as I said, if you don't have money, what do they, what are they going to, everyone has equal amounts of money, a universal credit. Um, what are they going to hack into? But yes, things, things such as wars, uh, government, you know, power and, you know, who has more power on, on another um, human being or um, another government system. Uh, these could become more so on an individual level they may not they may not be interested in hacking us but on a government level we have to it's a matter of time to wait and see whether these systems actually you know is is it worth russia hacking into uk when uk doesn't have any jobs left and they're all shipped to india or china um no consumers because we can't afford to actually, you know, buy these. Um, government already in debt, trying to deal with a healthcare system. What use is it? I mean, so what do they gain? So it, the whole scenario, the whole balance of power and the whole balance of e economics, knowledge, skill, everything may tilt in ways that are beyond our beyond recognition really so a new definitions for hackers so hacker we'll have to see what hackers would be interested in what is worth hacking into um yeah it's it's an interesting scenario thank you for your question these discussions are very important and it's not just we as consumers we may not be producers for example, Finland is training their entire population in artificial intelligence. And they're doing that not because they want to be at the forefront of producing the late, you know, later, you know, the best AI products and get the whole world to use their products, but it's really as consumers, they want their citizens to be comfortable with using AI, understand what they're getting into with AI having the power to reject AI where needed and, you know, understanding the whole, in not just on an individual, but an individual societal and national level and international level, what happens to our culture and life, really. Let's get to part two. So the first part dealt with uh, AI in the news, the type of products we are likely to have, um, AI and the societal structure, how it may impact us, and then AI and sustainability. Now, in the second part, we'll look at the economics of AI and 
um, what progress actually means for human society. At the talk today, I said I live in Scotland where James Watt was born and where the Industrial Revolution was born with the invention of the steam engine. Um, Scotland is also the birthplace of modern economics where Adam Smith was born. So Adam Smith died um, over 200 years ago in, in 1790, but he is, we still use his economics today. Let's see if this economics is actually relevant for an AI world. Now, everything we do, everything we wake up for, uh, we think about is money. Um, is it economically viable? Is that we are an economic superpower? Uh, what are the profits? When we say talk about profits, it's about money. Now, in an AI world where there's no jobs, what happens to the economics? Did the economics of yesterday or what we have today, ha has it helped us? Um, why do we have global financial crises constantly? Um, we don't see, they, they seem never ending. We seem to be in fear of when the next crash would come and we would lose our jobs. We have created an extremely complex economic system um, with uh, many layers of international trade, um, global growth, uh, you know, sanctions and imports and exports and trade restrictions and so on. There's entire newspapers and channels, TV channels dedicated to just seeing what's happening in the market. Now, when we developed uh, various products, in terms of medical products, we always see what the side effects of the medications are. Um, you know, whether they give you headaches or stomach ache or, you know, various things. Now, with the industrial revolution and the products we're developing today, have we thought about the side effects? So the industrial revolution has created an enormous stress on our planet from greenhouse emissions, um, products that we actually are trying to rectify and deal, deal with today. Um, huge industries, uh, there just seems to be no end to it. Trying to develop small things and nice pollution. And plastics. Um, we don't see the noise pollution in our backyard, but it's happening. All the cars on our roads that are filled, filling the atmosphere with greenhouse. There's a few things that became really important with the Industrial Revolution. One is speed. The second is efficiency. And the third one is profits. So all the time we talk about speed, efficiency, and profits. So with all of these products, what has happened um, once we finish the use of these? So all the computers, old computers, old cars. I'm sure um, James Watt didn't think that we would make our planet a scrapyard, you know, just to hold all these metallic and electronic waste that are contaminating our soil, our water, and our atmosphere. It's the same what happened with the AI revolution. These robots are ton this crap yard would have other things with say autonomous vehicles, electronic vehicles, hydrogen vehicles. We are just replacing these with new junk. Um, are we ready for all of this junk? Are we ready? How how do we how do we develop an ecosystem that is green with all the AI machinery that's going to take replace what we currently have. It just seems to be a never ending saga of um, unnecessary goods that are being dumped on human civilization. Do we need a new phone every year? And are these phones 
um, useful in some way. Of course, technology has improved. We are able to actually talk today because of technology. But is there a limit to what we need as a human species? And at the end of the day, why are we doing it? At the center of the industrial revolution was profits, money. Uh, we have entire systems dedicated to allow these things to happen through things like stock exchanges, financial investments in startups and so on, partnerships, trade deals between countries. Now, with the AI revolution, do these numbers mean anything? So in a jobless society, in a society where the GDP means nothing, or even if the GDP of UK is very high, does it actually mean that individual wealth is growing? What is the meaning of wealth in the new AI revolution? These systems were invented and used during the industrial revolution. And there was the main aspects of the industrial revolution, as I said, was speed, efficiency, and profits, and competition between countries, uh, the need to be the next superpower. In this race for superpower, we have actually probably lost our way a little bit. Um, the value of money is decreasing every day. We can't buy the same goods with what we have. And in a jobless society with no um, money, what does it actually mean? What do these things actually mean? What does money mean uh, or, or the value of money mean? B despite all of these things, and these are systems, as I said, are there lessons to be learned from the industrial revolution? These are systems that were developed during the industrial revolution and for a purpose um, but are they fit for the an AI revolution uh, is an economic system that was developed 250 years ago for products and an industry that was developed 250 years ago fit for an AI world as we scramble to put our the AI jigsaw puzzle together we don't want to develop more uh, products that would end humanity, their thinking skills, and their very need for existence. So we let's embrace this change, but embrace it in a way that we make the world a successful place for future generations. Now, how do we do that? What does success mean um, in an AI world? We already have young children who are embracing technology are born into a world where they only know technology. They can't imagine a world which, where the internet didn't exist or these phones didn't exist. Um, there are about 2 billion pe people in Generation Alpha, kids who are going to be born um, between, and from 2010 onwards. And these children are the custodians of the planet. Rather than thinking of them as consumers, maybe we should think about them as custodians of the planet who want to progress, who want to do well, who want a better life. And it's our responsibility to make sure that we develop systems that are good and useful for humanity. With the education system, for example, during COVID, we saw how difficult it was and how Again, outdated our system is, the education system that we have is 100 years old or more than 100 years old. And it's not fit for the next generation. The teaching methodology or the teaching systems are not fit for the next generation. Can we use AI to make it more exciting for kids of the next generation to learn? So AI need not be a bad thing that we should avoid, but AI, needs to be something that we embrace for the good of humanity, where we empower our creativity rather than replace it. Um, and that's why the developers of products, policymakers, strategists are very, very important in getting it right. Another area that could benefit from um, AI systems is health. As I said, during the Industrial Revolution, it is 
cost, well, efficiency, uh, speed, and profits that were at the center of most products developed. And that those very factors are probably very relevant in a healthcare system that will help both healthcare providers and patients where the costs can be brought down, where health could be made more affordable, um, where your health is at your fingertips and you're in control of your health, where there is no fear of actually going to a healthcare provider if you know, you're know you hesitant to go and find out something that you are scared of finding out. Um, and these are not just primary healthcare providers, all the allied healthcare professionals can use it in various scenarios. And these are very useful um, products. Um, AI is going to be part of our lives in decision-making. Um, here, for example, it's a research center where uh, AI products uh, are advising uh, researchers. Um, so together you could actually make better systems like during COVID and during the development of the vaccine, a lot of AI systems were used. We have actually come a long way as a human society, embracing technology, using it for, to our advantage, um, developing an entire culture around the technology that we developed um, from our work culture to our personal lives, to our social lives, um, to how we date, how we eat, how we order food, how we live. Um, but somewhere along the line, have we actually lost our or lost the plot, lost the track? Um, and are we ready uh, or is the AI system just going to replace exactly what we have today? So instead of a, if, instead of a laptop, we have an, you know, a, a robot, instead of a dial-up phone, we have a smarter hol hologram, holographic phone. Where, where does all this end? Um, what, what are we doing this for? Are we heading in the right direction as a human civilization? Um, can these systems become more useful for human consumption, um, for human development? It's actually easy for us to, what, what we're currently doing is replacing what we have with an AI product. But I think a complete overall is actually needed for um, the AI revolution. We cannot rely on an old system that was developed 250 years ago for a generation that doesn't understand nine to five jobs, for example. And we have done it all for money. At the end of the day, it was all about money. Um, but economics is changing, as I said, and economics has to change. We need to push the big reset button. And we can't expect uh, what I go back to this point about what is the value of money um, in a jobless society. Um, so in in with AI products, uh, for example, if we have, well, and what does the financial market actually mean? Um, does economics, you know, in terms of demand and supply, is it is it all change? You know, what, where where are we going to use these autonomous vehicles? Where are we going to use fingerprint recognition systems? Where is this digital world going to lead us? Let us now look at some of the other aspects of um, uh, artificial intelligence. Our evolution has led us to luxury or a comfortable life. But as we go ahead into the AI world, we have a system, we, we are giving the next generation a world that's digitized, a world that we have created a technological world 
an industrial world, a world that the next generation needs to take over and build? And how are we in the right direction? I don't think so. And I say that because we are heavily reliant on big data. We have a concrete world. We are handing over a concrete jungle with a Silicon Valley embedded in it somewhere, but lots of Silicon Valleys as we go along, um, where we may have smart cities, smart homes, but these smart homes may need oxygen pumping devices um, that adapt to the needs of their residents. So if you have four residents, you know, a very highly complex, highly developed software system could pump oxygen based on your needs, recycle the air, get rid of impurities in the air and so on. So we really um, need to question ourselves as to are the lessons that we have learned from the industrial revolution that we need to put in place and not make the same mistakes as we go along. One of the things that industrial revolution has actually taught us is to aim high, dream big, reach for the unreachable, increase productivity, work hard, and all of these things that become meaningless in a jobless society. But have these efforts, have these human efforts, like every day, every minute, every second, every human being on the planet wakes up in the morning and all they think about, all they strive for, work hard is for money is for financial gains. They invent new currencies like the Bitcoins, digital currency, and it's about money for the world, for the well-being of the world. Yet we have financial crisis. Yet we don't, we don't, we haven't seemed to have reached our goals. So has technological progress failed us as humanity? What about climate change? Technological progress can become such a huge problem that you cannot reverse it, or reversing it becomes very, very, very difficult. It is so massive, so huge, nature's fury knows no end. Has technology caused this? Has the industrial revolution caused it? And will AI revolution cause more havoc? Or should we stop it before it's too late? As I said, I, I, I love artificial intelligence. I live and breathe artificial intelligence. I want more artificial intelligence products. But lessons from the industrial revolution mean, are we going to continue on the path where food scarcity becomes, is a norm? not just in poor countries, but in rich countries, in countries in my street where there's probably someone struggling with their money or trying to make both ends meet. Is, it, is the AI world going to be the same? Is there going to be a change? Can we bring about a change? Has technological advances recognized human needs? And are the human needs um, addressed by an AI world? What is the human quotient at the end of the day? Why hasn't technology made us happier, healthier, more at peace, less anxious, less stressed with all our gadgets that we have around us, all the comforts that we have around us? We have a washing minute, none of you know, we are not going through hardships like our previous generations have, um, but people are dying younger. Um, they have more disease, health-related issues. Um, why is this happening? So 
technological progress doesn't mean it's human progress. Technological progress, the whole definition of progress has to change. If technology is going to create problems for humanity, if intelligence of humans is going to replace humanity itself, if 65 million people died in the Second World War. So we have the intelligence of humans so intelligent that they can they are ready to replace humans. Perhaps we need to rethink what progress means. Um, progress and profits should be more about health, well-being, job satisfaction, life satisfaction. Um, and factors such as that. And to allow that to happen, to create a world, to create an AI world that's good for everybody, that's useful for everybody, I think consumer power and consumer uh, needs, ethics and voices become more and more important. Um, yes, there are areas and sectors where the consumer has no power, such as where chat GPT, may enter our scenes and we have no power to stop it or um, financial banks where they are closing um, banks and you know replacing them with AI systems um, are just thrust on us. Um, it's a question that we need to ask authorities, policymakers, product developers, strategists, and ourselves individually in our society as to whether we are heading in the right direction, whether consumers have a choice, what is it as a human race we need and want? What does it mean by progress? What place does economics have in a new world? There are are the lessons that we have learned from the Industrial Revolution. Um, it's very important to take a holistic view. So governments and countries that are pumping in uh, a lot of money uh, to be ahead of the curve in terms of AI power are probably going to be the countries where the people don't have the resources to use these products. The way we use our skills and talents are going to change and have to change. There was no unemployment when we were living in tribes. Uh, people had hope. There was no hopeless situation. Everybody had a job to play. They would, um, you know, someone would look after the cattle or hold a little pole to get it fitted somewhere to be tied to something, you know gather the crop and so on. So everybody's skill was utilized for something. And human beings are so skilled, so skilled, so intelligent that we can now replace humans itself, as I said, and create more intelligent beings. And so at the heart of our discussion, at the heart of AI, we should have uh, principles in place that guide us um, in, 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 a, in a march forward in an AI world. The first thing to do is um, wherever possible, um, together we should stop products that would cause the planet more harm than good, that would cause individuals and corporations more harm than good. And so Gatherings such as this, where people come together to understand more about AI, discussions around the home, discussions in your church or community or wherever you meet in the workplace, your voice matters and it makes a difference. So let's lead with curiosity, innovate with purpose and shape a future we are really proud of. And we can do that and we can create a cool planet for the next generations. Um, I love AI, I'll continue to love AI, I will develop products in AI, but um, we don't need to destroy the world in that process. 
So thank you all for your participation today. Uh, we'll take in the next set of questions and uh, continue with our discussion. Thank you, Anne. Absolutely brilliant. Okay, so we have got some more questions here. Um, we've got a question from Julian, who says, if we end up with a world where there is little work and instead we all get paid a standard monthly allowance, how do we differentiate ourselves in terms of those that wish to stretch themselves rather than those that wish to just lounge all day? Um, it's a good question, Julian. Um, yes, and that's where probably we'll end up as philosophers and poets and uh, songwriters and do what comes naturally to human beings perhaps. Um, but I hope we don't create a world where our jobs are replaced by um, machines. We definitely don't want a world where machines overtake humans, where there are more machines than humans or you know, maybe maybe GDP will be replaced by um, MDP, machines per human being, something like that. You know, how many machines per head do you have? And if you have more machines per head, that means you're really progressed as a country. You you have developed. You you know you're there. Um, definitely don't want a world like that, but. Stretching ourselves then becomes an individual pursuit. Um, it will become a community pursuit. Perhaps we would rely on each other as a community. Perhaps we become closer as a community. Perhaps we'll go back to living as tribes in our, in, in our communities. Um, I think we should not forget the human history uh, and human civilization. Um, in its march to perfection, in its march to progress, in its march to achievement, in its march to utilizing their skills. Um, I think one of the things, I'm an educator, and one of the things that I um, always have said is that people are satisfied only when the skills are utilized. When there is no utilization of their skills in whatever form, they become stressed, they become, they start feeling useless. They start feeling that they're, they're not of much use to society or your family or your neighbor and so on. So it is, uh, I think we'll find ways of actually um, um, stretching our skills, stretching ourselves and making ourselves useful to society. Um, but, I just hope we don't get to a stage where I, I do believe that we need a society, we need to create a culture where every person's skills are used. It doesn't matter if that person is just standing and looking after cattle or tying something up on their roof or painting something. It just doesn't matter. However big or small, every person's skills need to be utilized. Otherwise, the world will just come to an end, and that's not good for next generations. Thanks, Julian. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's another question here. Uh, shouldn't we use AI only to help certain parts of society, like healthcare, etc., and not in sectors where the main objective objective of using AI is to help us making money? Yes. Um, I definitely think that we need to get to a stage where technology is used for the good of society. Um, not tech that kills 65 million people in the Second World War. Um, not tech that pollutes our planet. Not tech with a tech without long term vision of what it does to our planet individually as humans and on a you know a collective level um yes there are certain sectors that could benefit at the moment based on the problems that planet earth is dealing with uh, humans are dealing with 
definitely healthcare is a really important sector, not just because we want early diagnosis of diseases or prediction or more control over health and so on, but also to reduce the cost. So health becomes more affordable and more accessible. Um, when people have money, sometimes chat GPT becomes more important than health. The reason people don't go towards health that much is also because the results are not that quick. So the return on investment is not that quick. And it's still difficult even with AI systems to have very precise you know, diagnosis and prediction. Um, as I said, uh, diabetic retinopathy, Google have failed by 200%. Um, and got it completely wrong. This so they shelved that uh, system. But in health, but investment in healthcare, if that were successful, or some other health prediction system would be successful, we could have avoided COVID or things that have happened during COVID. Um, but yeah, I guess we are too uh, in a rush for money, right? We're rush for profits. Uh, that whole um, definition has to change. Um, and that's where I think voices, consumer power becomes important. There's another question. I don't know if you want to read it because it's quite long. So maybe you could read it and kind of answer it as you... Yeah, seems uh, economic competition is dominating the need for building or creating for the greater good. Do you think some form of harmonizing the design of AI products and services imperative? Example, some type of global body diverse in makeup on decision making will support a balance of needs and benefits of our world. Maybe we have too many world commission that lose their way, but I remain optimistic. Um, I concur with you in every word of what you have written there, Carol. It's very, very important that we have cooperation between countries. Um, and yes, we, again, the systems, the organizations, everything that were in place, including things like stock exchange or the UN, various things, we're all catering for other needs. We're all catering to another philosophy a whole philosophical perspective has to change. Uh, when the Industrial Revolution started, exploitation of resources started, colonization started, invasion started, the drive for superpower started, uh, to be the next superpower started. And exploitation was not just of resources, but also human resources, that means slavery. Uh, we still have human resources in our, uh, you know, workplaces today. And it is a modern age slavery in some ways, despite all the benefits that we get. Um, so, yes, uh, the new uh, words should not be, the, a competition should be replaced by cooperation. Uh, exploitation uh, should be replaced and it should be shared resources, sharing of resources. Um, but I am optimistic, um, like you, um, but also, um, a cynical in some ways, especially because I live in Scotland and people become quite pretty, pretty pessimistic when you live in Scotland. Well, we gave birth to James Watt and Adam Smith, who probably created this whole world that we are living in. Um, apart from that, the weather gets really bad here and you take an umbrella, even though it's a sunny day. So I think caution is needed going forward with these uh, systems. Um, there are many researchers um, uh, who are trying to develop technology for good, who are trying to develop technology for health care, who are trying to develop systems where you know, they'll be useful for the underprivileged. That will bring in more equality among populations across the world where these systems are more affordable. Now, driverless cars are great, um, but they only cater to a certain section of the community. Um, you know, going to Mars is great for a, for a tourist ride, 
but it only caters for certain sections of the community. But there are many other researchers, research groups that are actually, you know, building on the knowledge um, that they have, um, catering to the good of society across countries. So yes, there is hope. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you. I've got a, a comment here. It's not a question, but it's a, it's a comment to say how much I've enjoyed listening to uh, to Anne and to hear her insight into the development and application of A in our lives and how it relates to humanity. So I think that's just a thank you. Thank you so how much. much, for much that. Enjoyed. Um, does anybody else have any questions? If anybody wants to raise their hand, we've got a couple of minutes left. If anybody would like to speak. Um, there's a question from Helio Silva. Uh, shouldn't we use AI only to help certain parts? Like, yeah, that I got, we got that, we covered yeah, that, right? That um, farming industry benefits from innovation, but not in the best way. Yes. Um, but, but we all need food. Um, we all need to eat to survive. So the three sectors that I personally would like more investment to go into is agriculture, education, and healthcare. These are the th three. Um, if you have good, you know, good healthcare, good nutrition, good healthcare, and good education, that's not just education to in STEM subjects and coding and these kind of things, but education about life in general, um, you know, uh, and making them understand the philosophy of life, the meaning of life, society, um, and getting into what we always as humans pondered over, um, rather than be, for it's a survival skill. You need to, and these are important, uh, and they learn about ethics and, and uh, other things, but, these are important to understand because when you're developing a product, if you don't have that background, you develop products that are that you think are useful. You're putting in a lot of effort, a lot of money, a lot of energy into it. But what for in the end? You know, you 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 lose that long-term vision. And so we need more um people coming in um, with the right vision. Um, and I'm sure we will, because that's that's what human civilization has done across you know, millennia. So let's hope that you know, we are paving the way for a brighter future for ourselves, because a lot of us will be grandparents and great grandparents, and we don't want <laughs> uh, you know, a difficult world to live in and grow old in. Um, so it's not about the next generation, but for us. And also many of many, many in my generation, for example, um, have the unique capacity, have the unique op had the unique opportunity to actually see the world from a lens of when we didn't have internet, when we didn't have emails, when we didn't have smartphones, and now going through that transition into the next generation. So we are a little bit like all those hundred year olds who actually lived without, you know, um, washing machines or, you know, all the modern gadgets we have. Um, and we probably are seeing that through our lifetime and we have the ability to, to make a difference in this world. So thank you all for your participation. Any other questions, please? Um, we, do have, uh, we do have a hand up actually. Uh, Joao has a question. Joao, would you like to unmute yourself? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, you mentioned three main areas, Anne, but I was wondering if areas like transportation and uh, you know physical communication between us, not necessarily speaking, but uh, you know the the conventional mail that you get at your home, you know you commuting from home to work or from a city to another country to another, cannot benefit from um, from AI in some sense, and you know. We were talking about um, about uh, you know how, how the climate's changing and all that. You know, AI can help a lot with getting transportation to be as efficient as it can be. And uh, you know, is it maybe you know still um, 
let me rephrase it. You know, I'm not any a native English speaking uh, speaker, so I need to, to rephrase it sometimes. But is it is it um, necessary, or could we do some more uh, work into you know getting that physical communication uh, more integrated with AI, and you know make it more efficient and make it more reliable for everyone? Because a lot of countries still have you know, third world problems regarding communication, you know, trains don't work, planes don't work, uh, roads are ridiculously busy all the time. And how can we make it more efficient? And, you know, how could it make our lives better in that sense? Yes, thank you so much for that question. Um, yes, I totally understand that. And that's why some of the, uh, you know, driverless cars become meaningless in these societies and countries, right? Um, the problem, though, with um, AI that's currently being in, or the, or the, or the, or the, um, you know, energy or investment and efforts technologically that's put into uh, transportation at the moment is a is 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 seems to be more about replace, you know, the diesel and petrol ones with electric vehicles and. Uh, hydrogen vehicles um, and so on, but these just add to the problem. Um, electric vehicles are not as green that you think they are. These batteries are extremely heavy. Um, they run out of steam very quickly. You need more charging stations. Um, the chemicals required to develop these batteries are drawn using enormous power, which are not always green ways of, you know, retrieving uh, these chemicals or using them in, in, in an industrial setting. So the efforts that are being put in to make these systems green are not actually green. That's number one. It is actually an advantage for countries where systems are not already in place to develop completely new transportation systems that are even beyond cars, beyond electric vehicles, beyond uh, you know, hydrogen uh, powered vehicles. It's because you're starting from scratch, right? You're starting from scratch. And these countries where they're starting from scratch, where the infrastructure is not already in place, where there's regulation not already in place, are ideal places for innovation to happen with AI. Um, and yes, it's very possible. Um, and maybe I should, you know, include along with the three sectors, transportation as a sector. But the reason I didn't actually mention transportation as one of the priorities in terms of AI investment is mainly because the way we work is going to change. Um, so commuting, so we'll probably have more local global villages or local villages that are connected globally. So I am sitting here in a small corner of Scotland. Um, in a, from a small corner in Scotland, all these inventions came up that took over the entire world. Um, somehow they were able to, whiskey comes from Scotland and all over the world people drink Scotch whiskey or you know are desperate for Scotch whiskey. So, Human beings have always found a way of communicating, uh, communicating even with pigeons, you know, like I'm going back in time. But I just feel that the priority is not as big right now in terms of where the investment has to go. But where it does go, places where infrastructure is not already in place are excellent test beds to create Entirely, and I think we should just go beyond cars. Um, it it has to be from scratch. Um, it isn't about fixing the problems we've already created or finding solutions for the problems we've already created. Introduce these new problems into uh, an area 
of the of planet Earth where these problems don't exist, um, that's not the answer. So I think a, a completely new system is needed for transportation if transportation becomes extremely important. But transportation between countries still, you know, is something that needs to be thought of off and you know aeroplanes and things like that that again contribute to uh, climate crisis i am not really i haven't put much thought into that area but um i'm sure i wouldn't say we have to replace aeroplanes as a way i'm quite confident that we can replace cars and other vehicles locally on ground and on sea but in terms of uh, flight between countries, I think that just the need for travel or desire for travel may reduce just uh, in humans. But then if you look at human civilization as a whole, we traveled, didn't we, on foot or I don't know how many of them ended up in Finland from Africa. They probably went there and thought, well, what a cool, nice country. Let's freeze <laughs> in this weather rather than sit in sunny Africa. Um, but we have always managed a way of trans moving around the world, moving around the planet. Uh, and I think the next generation will find a way. And I hope AI will actually contribute to this movement of human beings around the world in a much more efficient way. Thank you all for your participation. I really appreciate it. And please feel free to get in touch anytime if there's anything. If it's just to have a discussion, either way, you're always welcome because this isn't just about me talking about things that I've been pondering into and looking into, but it's also from questions like yours that it makes people like me think in a much more broader sense and um, in ways that I haven't thought about before. Um, because we're all conditioned, aren't we, to think in a certain way. So get it co coming out of that box through discussions like these is very important. And we hope to have more discussions like this in the future. And I, ho I hope you join us there. Thank you so much again.